What is this? At first glance, this thing doesn't look like much. Honestly, it looks like a prop from a school science fair, but the moment you understand what it does and how it does it, everything changes. Because this isn't new tech, it's actually based on invention from the 19th century, the spectroheliograph. Back then, it was a massive, expensive piece of lab equipment that only big observatories could use. And now? You can put one on the back of your telescope and take high resolution images of the sun in any wavelength you want, right from your backyard. And the images you can get with this thing are just stunning. Thanks to an open source project called Solex and a small company called ML Astro, this forgotten piece of history is suddenly one of the most exciting tools in solar imaging. I've had the ML Astro SHG700 on loan for a couple weeks now, and I've been testing it every sunny day I could get, and in today's video I'll be walking you through how it works, how to set it up, what the learning curve looks like, and of course I'll show you the images I was able to capture with it. Let's get right into it. My name is Lutz and you're watching The Space Koala. So let's talk about how this magical little box actually works, because the concept behind the spectroheliograph, though sounds intimidating at first, once you get it, it is genuinely fascinating. Now if you're used to H-alpha telescopes or something like the quark, you're probably used to capturing the whole disk of the sun through a narrowband filter, and that filter selects the specific wavelength you want to image, like H-alpha. But the spectroheliograph does the exact opposite. Instead of filtering for a single wavelength across the whole disk, it lets all wavelengths through, but only for a tiny vertical strip of the sun. That narrow slice of light is then dispersed into a spectrum and analyzed in a completely different way. You mount the SHG on the back of your refractor just like you would a camera. It's designed to work best with f6 to 7 or slower refractors like the 80 millimeter refractor that I have here. If you're using something similar, you don't need any extra filters, but if your telescope is over 100 millimeters in aperture, I'd recommend adding some kind of energy rejection filter, either an IR cut or actually for the best results with the most contrast, even a deep sky narrowband filter like a deep sky H alpha to cut down on heat while still letting your wavelength through. Now, here's what happens inside the device. Your telescope focuses an image of the sun on its focal plane and right there the SHG places a tiny vertical slit. Only that tiny slice of sunlight gets through. Passing through the slit, the light rays begin to diverge again. They're spreading out. That's why the first thing the SHG does is pass them through a collimator, which again then makes the rays parallel. That collimated light then hits a diffraction grating. Imagine a tiny mirror with thousands and thousands of microscopic grooves on it. These grooves add like a tiny slit-shaped source spreading out light to a full rainbow of wavelengths, but differently from prism by interference rather than refraction. That dispersed spectrum is still a fan of parallel rays, so the SHG includes a refocusing lens that brings the rainbow back into focus right onto your camera sensor. And here's the clever part. Your camera is mounted on the end of this arm, at the elbow of which you have the grating. The angle of this grating can actually be adjusted and the angle will determine which part of the spectrum actually ends up on the sensor. And by adjusting the angle, you're literally moving the sensor to the part of the rainbow that you're interested in. So the full light path looks like this. You have the telescope, then you have the slits, then you have the collimator, then here you have the grating, then you have a refocusing lens, and finally the camera, with the grating angle deciding which wavelength you capture. Now, what you end up seeing on the screen isn't the sun, at least not yet. It looks more like a barcode, a thin stretched out horizontal strip of spectrum. You'll see a bright background and across it sharp black absorption lines, each one corresponding to a specific element in the sun's atmosphere hydrogen, helium, calcium, they all show up here. The darkest one right near the center in this case, that's H-alpha, and it's what we'll be working with for most of this video. If you look closely at the H-alpha line, you'll notice that it's not perfectly smooth. It varies in intensity, and you'll see that some parts dip below or rise above the rest of the line. Just keep this in mind, it's going to be important later when we talk about how this turns into more than just a picture. 
For now, all you need to know is that we're not capturing the sun all at once. We're slicing off one vertical layer at a time with laser-like precision to get our barcode image. And now that we understand how a spectral heliograph works, let's talk about setting up and what I think is the part that makes this feel overwhelming for the first time you try getting everything into focus three times. So how do we focus this thing? This is probably the part that throws most people off the first time. There's actually three different things to focus. First, the telescope has to focus onto the slit. Then the collimator lens inside has to focus onto the slit too. And then the dispersed spectrum has to be focused onto the camera sensor. This sounds like a lot, but it's actually all quite logical and simple once you've done it once. You always start with the camera. For this first focus step, you don't even need the sun or the telescope for that matter. You can literally take the SHG, point it at the blue daytime sky, and you'll already have a spectrum. That's because the diffraction grating splits the diffused sunlight into a rainbow no matter what. You'll see all the absorption lines and your goal is to get those lines sharp. There's a micrometric focuser built into the SHG for this and it's incredibly precise. It's very satisfying by the way. You slowly dial it until those curved spectral lines look crisp and well-defined and while you're doing that you rotate the camera so that the lines sit horizontally across your sensor not at an angle. Once both are correct, you lock it in. This won't change until you physically mess with it. At this point, you can move on to the next step, which is the collimator focus. You literally just have to check that the edge of the illuminated field that you get is as sharp as possible. Once you've done these two steps, you won't have to touch any of them unless you switch to a different wavelength. As a last step, we move on to the telescope focus. To do this, we have to slew to the sun and then we focus and that might sound challenging since we're not seeing the whole disc but the trick is you do see structure in that tiny slice for rough focus you'll see the edge of the sun moving in the frame and as you get closer details start to appear fine vertical structures in the line correspond to granulation on the surface of the sun and if you should land on a sunspot you'll see deep black streaks crossing the spectrum once that structure sharpens up you know that you've nailed the telescope focus as well okay so we have our beautiful barcode now and what do you do when you have a barcode you scan it and that's exactly what we're gonna do. No, but seriously, to build a full image of the sun, we actually do have to scan across the disk line by line. Let me show you how that works. You start with the sun just outside of the slit, slightly above or below it, and then using your mount's controls, you slew the telescope slowly across the solar disk in right ascension. This is important for the easiest option. You need to be in equatorial mode because the scan needs to happen in a straight, predictable direction that lines up with the orientation of this lit. As you scan, you record a video and what you're capturing is the changing shape and intensity of the spectral line in the wavelengths you selected, in our example, H alpha, as different parts of the sun pass across the slit. So for every frame in the video, you're getting a slightly different vertical slice of the sun's surface. And now here's the part where you can really optimize performance. You want to record the video quickly. To get those high frame rates, the trick is to minimize the area of the sensor you're capturing. In my case, I'm using fire capture and I'll just draw a small rectangle around the part of the spectrum that I'm interested in, which is centered around the hydrogen alpha line. This does two things. First, it boosts the frame rate significantly since we're only reading a small portion of the sensor. And second, it keeps the file size more manageable, which is great if you're recording a lot of scans. Once you've framed your region of interest and dialed in your scan speed, go ahead and start recording. The scan itself usually takes a few to a few dozen seconds depending on your speed. And at the end, you'll have a single video that contains all the information needed to rebuild a full solar disk in software. Next up, we're gonna use JSOLEX, which is a free open source program. And honestly, I still can't believe how good this software is. It's powerful, full of features, and it just works. First, you load your video scan into JSOLEX. The software will automatically identify the spectral line you're interested in, in this case, hydrogen alpha. 
You can also manually tell it which line to track, especially if you're working in other wavelengths like helium or calcium K. Then for each frame of your video, the software analyzes the intensity of that line frame by frame, one stripe at a time, and it stitches all of them together to reconstruct a full disk image of the sun. It's basically rebuilding the sun one slice at a time based entirely on the variation in brightness along the spectral line. If your scan speed was a bit too fast or too slow and your solar disk turns out not quite circular, don't worry, JSOLEX is actually really good at correcting that. It can rescale your image and apply geometric corrections automatically. However, for the best possible results, you should synchronize your slew speed to the camera speed. In that case, you'll get a perfect circle already at the start. If you have too many slices, it takes you longer to do a full scan. And if you have too few slices, you'll be missing parts of the sun. The result? A beautifully clean solar disk ready to explore, but we're just getting started. JSOLEX gives you several viewing modes. You can look at the raw reconstruction just to check that everything came together. You can toggle an auto stretched view, which is incredibly helpful for showing prominences and chromosphere details with much more contrast. You can extract a continuum image, which shows the photosphere, things like granulation and sunspots, similar to what you would get from a white light filter. And then there's my favorite, the Doppler view. Remember earlier when I said that the H alpha absorption line isn't completely flat. It has tiny bumps and dips along its length. Those are real red shifts and blue shifts in the hydrogen signal caused by material moving on the surface of the sun, either towards us or away from us. The Doppler view shows these views and you can also identify the structures and their speeds. It also gives you some additional views, a uh, false color rendering if you just want a pretty easy to read image, an active region map where the software automatically identifies bright spots, flares, or any other events happening on the solar surface and highlights them for you. And here's the cool thing. This is all completely automated. You load the scan, tell it what line to use, and it does the rest. And it also supports scripting, so you can batch process dozens of scans if you want to. So a single scan already gives you an impressive image. But what if you want to go further and bring out fainter features, more contrast, and subtle detail? Just like with planetary imaging, the key is simple, add more data. In the case of the SHG, that means doing multiple scans of the sun, as many clean passes as you can manage before the solar features start changing too much. I usually aim for 15 to 20 scans in one session. That's a good sweet spot in my opinion, enough to improve signal the noise and reveal the fine structure while still staying within the window before prominences or surface features drift or evolve too much. Once you get your scans, JSOLEX has a built-in feature that lets you batch reconstruct them. Just load all the video files into the program and you can have it automatically generate the reconstructed solar disk images for each one. After that, you're in familiar territory most likely. You've got a folder full of full disk images and you can process them just like any other solar photo. In my case, I took those images and I stacked them in auto -secured. I did some basic sharpening and tone curve adjustment in IMPPG and then I colorize the final result however I like. In my case, I use PixInsight. I won't go into full processing steps here. ML Astro has a great tutorial on their YouTube channel and there are lots of other general solar processing guides you can follow. Once you've done the SHG scan and reconstruction, the rest of the workflow is exactly like regular solar imaging. After spending some time with the ML Astro SHG 700, I have to say I'm really impressed with what this system can do. Once you understand the setup and get your scan process dialed in, it's honestly addictive. Let me show you a few of the results. The first image is hydrogen alpha and you can immediately see the level of detail. The prominences, the filaments, the uneven texture in the chromosphere, everything just pops. The contrast is amazing and it is so clean across the whole disk. 
then I tried something different. I adjusted the gradient angle to move over to Helium D3. This wavelength gives you a very different view. It's softer, but there's a clarity to the limb that I really like, especially when you boost the contrast a little bit. It's one of those wavelengths that doesn't get as much attention, but it, it has potential in my opinion. And then of course, I had to try Calcium K. This one really surprised me. Even though the signal is fainter and my telescope is really not that sharp in UV, the details are are really sharp and the sunspot detail comes through beautifully. I even managed to get some prominences. It's a very different aesthetic from H alpha. It is colder, more high contrast, but it tells a whole other story about what's happening on the solar surface. What really stands out for me is the level of flexibility, being able to adjust the grading and instantly explore a different layer of the sun's atmosphere. That's not something you can do with traditional solar filters. And once everything is aligned and focused, the process becomes very predictable. You know exactly what to expect from each scan and that makes it easy to experiment and improve. So, what's the verdict on the ML Astro SHG700? First of all, I'll be very honest, there is a steep learning curve. This isn't something that you just plug in and go, and the first time I set it up, it definitely felt like a lot. The triple focus, the slit alignment, the mount orientation, the scan speed, the reconstruction, but the more I used it, the more it made sense. Each step is logical, and once you understand why you're doing it, you can control every part of the process. And I think that's the key a little bit. This system is controllable. Every single factor that affects image quality can be isolated and adjusted. You're not fighting with tuning knobs or temperature drift. You're building a structured system where you can repeat the same result day after day. As for performance, I've used a Quark and I've used a double stacked Coronado telescope. Both can give very good results, but I've never been able to get full disk images from them that looked as clean, even, and detailed as I was able to get with the SHG700. The contrast across the disk, the control over the wavelength, the ability to extract Doppler and continuum layers is just a completely different class of tool. That said, it's important to understand what this is not for. This is not for visual observation. You cannot look through it. You absolutely must not look through it. Not only will you risk your eyesight, you will also not actually see the sun. So if you're after a visual solar experience, the SHG is just not the right choice. Stick with the Quark or a dedicated H-alpha scope. And I believe it is also not ideal if your goal is close-up solar imaging. This setup is optimized for full disk imaging. That's where it truly shines. There are ways to do mosaics and scan smaller regions. And I know that JSOLEX does support mosaic mode, but I haven't explored that yet. So for now, everything I've done has been full disk only. And that's the use case where this system is at its best. Let's talk about the price because this is another area where the SHG700 stands out. The spectroheliograph costs $880 and that's honestly a very friendly price when you consider what it's capable of. Not only is it far more affordable than a dedicated solar telescope, it costs also significantly less than a quark and unlike those it doesn't lock you into a single wavelength. You can scan H-alpha, you can scan helium, you can scan calcium K and more just by adjusting the gradient angle. So from a value perspective it's a no-brainer. I'll put the order link in the description below if you want to check it out. Just keep in mind ML Astro is a small company and production is done in batches so when you sign up you're joining the current build run. Once the batch is ready they ship them out all together. It's not instant but you are getting a handcrafted precision optical instrument and to me that's worth the wait. As for me, this unit was on loan for testing, but I'm, I think I'm going to ask Amalastro if I can purchase it from them as I truly had a lot of fun and I have a lot more ideas of things that I want to try out. If you enjoyed this video, show your support by leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel. It helps me out and lets me know which type of content you prefer. And as always, clear skies and sunny ones too. It got totally cloudy during the video and now overhead it's blue everywhere. So at least it's going to be a clear night.